telling the truth. Is it on now? Uh, Rowan, would you like to just explain for a few minutes who you are, sure. uh, since you have not had an opportunity to speak until now? Thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you very much for having us here today. I'm an executive director of an uh, NGO called National Bureau of Translation, Kazakhstan. Um, my colleague from National Museum mentioned the uh, Rouhani Jangru program, uh, which is modernization of Kazakhstan's identity. So English title of the program put in these words. And uh, as a part of this initiative, uh, my organization responsible for two very interesting projects, translation projects. Uh, first one is uh, new humanitarian knowledge, 100 new textbooks in Kazakh language. So what we do essentially, we work with uh, well-known universities and uh, publishers from all over the world, acquire licenses for uh, best-selling textbooks uh, from humanitarian subjects for universities, translate them into Kazakh, and distribute among universities in Kazakhstan for free. This is one, and the second one uh, called a Contemporary Kazakh Culture in Modern World, uh, which is about translating into six UN languages anthologies of Kazakh literature. This is just part of this work, but uh, we're talking about not only literature, but music, theater, uh, dance, uh, art, and etc. So I just wanted to share some ideas, probably more questions than answers when it comes to contemporary uh, translation job, translation work, translation work. Uh, it is very exciting, but also quite challenging project. And I also wanted to hear probably some of your ideas on questions that we have around this job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we've heard quite a lot. Is this working? I can't. It's okay. Yeah. We've heard quite a lot in the last hour about... John. This, this one. Is this one working? This one is working as well. Okay. Thanks. So we've been talking about multiple identities, and particularly Martin talking about something which Philip Dodd from the Institute of Contemporary Arts said, which is, countries no longer matter, it's cities. Uh, and there's a book just been written called If Mayors Ruled the Earth by Benjamin Barber, making the same argument that national cultures are less and less important and city culture is more important. Uh, but I don't think Donald Trump would agree with that. Uh, and I think there are more and more national leaders around the world who would not agree with that. So there's a tension between an increase or a resurgence of nationalism and a desire for people to express their identity in city terms and in and in this region, in this country, I'm always struck by the fact that uh, people say, oh, you haven't been to Almaty. You know, well, forget about Astana. Almaty is the place that really matters. Uh, but Astana has got its own identity. Almaty has got its own identity. Obviously, Bishkek, Dushanbe, all these cities have their own identity. So I would like to start by asking the panel briefly to say something about how they see the relationship between our city identities, if you like, our ability to identify as citizens of a city and our ability to identify as citizens of a country and what that means in terms of our perceptions. Because what Martin was talking about in Hull, it's clear that it's very easy to motivate people who feel disengaged from the life of their city to feel they have some commitment to it as volunteers, to be proud of their city, that's a very, very easy equation to write. So I'd like to ask each of the panel briefly to talk about how they see this <coughs> tension or balance, perhaps it's better to put it, between city identity and national identity. Kieran, could I start by dumping Thank you. on you? Um, I Again, I don't see it as a, as a tension. I think it's perfectly reasonable to be proud of being from a city, but also from a country. So it, it's an additive dimension. In 
I think in, in our world around uh, coming from the kind of cultural relations side, what it means is the relationship between countries can be different to the relationship between cities, can be different to the relationship between institutions. Um, so let me give an example. You know, politically, there is tension at the moment between you know, the government of the United Kingdom and the Gush government of the Russian Federation, but the relationship between London and Moscow is fantastic, and the relationship between the London Underground and Moscow Metro is even better. So I think it's about multiple levels. So I don't, I don't believe at all that there's a tension, and I don't think there's a contradiction between being very proudly Hull and being very proudly English and being very proudly British and being very proudly... European or a citizen of the world. So I, I don't see it. I see it as just another exciting dimension in the mosaic, which is culture and identity. Uh, and I think if we ever allow the conversation to go to um, saying it's about cities, it's not about nations, then we're missing the point entirely. It's about both, and both are wonderful. Thank you. Martin. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, that Philip Dodd thing is, is, is provocative. I, I, I don't necessarily believe it, by the way. Um, I, you know, thank God for cities, I think, because they, they, they tend to be a, a hub of positive thinking. So if you look at, you know, the situation in the UK at the moment, you know, you, there are various islands of sensible thinking, and one of them is London, whereas the, the rest of the nation, you know, has some different opinions. I mean, I'm... You know, I, I would say I'm a European, you know, before I'm anything else. Um, and I think, I think what cities can do and what the artists in cities can do is, is try and always drive forward. Um, because I think there are other sections which, which, you know, attempt to pull that back. And that's when you get into that interesting conversation about, uh, you know, modernity and identity. Uh, of nations. Like I say, you know, everybody's story makes up the patchwork of identity. But I think what artists to do and what culture can do is take with it the best of what has been, but constantly drive forward. Um, and and that, that, that's what that landscape means to me, if that makes any sense at all. Elmira, how do you respond to that? I think that it's a very interesting comparison, especially to например, for Bishkek, Astana and London. И очень много зависит, наверное, еще от истории. Например, постколониальная история Бишкека и Астаны, которая очень небольшая, и колониальная история Лондона. И это тоже имеет значение, потому что это имеет отношение к идентичности. Например, мы до сих пор еще не проговорили свой колониальный период советский. Я уверена, в Астане тоже. Этот дискурс еще не развился, и Целиноград... Это очень драматическая история. Может быть, я что-то не знаю. Военный городок Бишкек – это тоже э, особая история. И наше восприятие урбанистики в этом смысле очень сильно отличается от того замечательного британского дискурса, который здесь э, продвигается. И я очень надеюсь, что он у нас будет. И в этом смысле я согласна с спикером справа от вас, что в этом смысле гораздо важнее э, ощущение гражданственности – по ценностям. Мне кажется, что привязка к месту, и здесь я использую э, замечательный миф, который я буквально недавно деконструировала. И в этом смысле мне хочется быть кочевником и не привязываться. И та высокая мобильность, которая происходит в нашем регионе, в моей стране, в Бишкеке, она показывает, что отношение к городам не столь трепетно сегодня, на мой взгляд, пока, как это может быть в Лондоне, в старом Лондоне, в Европе. Uh, yeah. uh, if I may, I'd like to a bit elevate this picture from a local to global identity issue, because uh, last year, being in this very intense exchange between the world community and my own culture by uh, doing translation job, on the one hand, we see um, big surprise of my colleagues here in Kazakhstan, who, scientists who translate uh, history textbook written by Western scientists, uh, and they see that in 1,000-page world history, there is no even single line about Kazakhstan and these great steps. Uh, there is nothing about Kazakhstan that gave apples to the world, 
domestication of horse to the world, and etc., etc. And it is really uh, a big surprise for a lot of people here. On the other hand, we're trying to uh, exchange and share our culture values to the world, doing translation of our uh, literature into six UN languages and 120,000 copies of Kazakh literature will be uh, distributed in uh, more than 70 countries with 2.5 uh, billion people. But doing this job, we found ourselves in a situation when we are now asking ourselves what we are doing. Are we trying to impose ourselves to them, saying that please, uh, we would like to be seen, heard and understood as we are, or um, uh, our colleagues from Cambridge University Press who are doing uh, English version of the translation, they come up with the uh, me meaning, uh, which is not just translation, but cultural induction. So we do linear translation, other our colleagues doing literary editing, and then other specialists from Cambridge doing cultural induction. And my question is, what is cultural induction? Are you saying that just translation of Kazakh literature as it is wouldn't be accepted by English people? Would, uh, is there any risk to be rejected? And in order, in order to be accepted and understood, it should be uh, another work, induction. And uh, what we're saying uh, uh, about when we, when we say about induction is just, uh, in, in some cases, it's, uh, it seems that uh, people feel that it should be somehow adjusted. So uh, uh, this uh, ex uh, exchange between specialists, so 60 authors from Kazakhstan, more than 100 people involved in uh, translation work in this cultural induction process, uh, uh, this exchange is more important for me right now than just uh, publication of textbooks uh, and, and books and dissemination them. I believe that based in this uh, humane um, exchange between people, uh, creative communities, we can build this, that understanding. Thank you. Thanks. There's many things to pick up there, but one thing I'd like to, to touch on before we come back to some of these points is, um, as well as a city identity and a, and a national identity, there's a regional identity as well. We're having, this is a regional event, and it strikes me as an, as an outsider that in this part of Asia, you have China on one side, very confident about its increasing power and influence. You have Russia on the other side, asserting its power and influence because perhaps it's not feeling quite as confident as it once was. And you have Turkey uh, with the beginnings of an attempt or a, a desire to recreate the Ottoman Empire. You've got three big players and this Central Asia region as a region is very much in the middle. And I, I wonder as an outsider to what extent a regional identity as an important part of people's consciousness about the present and the future in this part of the world. And Elmira, I'd like to ask you first to respond to that. Спасибо. Это очень парадоксальная вещь. Например, по Китаю. Мы недавно делали исследование по восприятию Китая в странах Центральной Азии. И выяснилось, что это восприятие формируется из двух составных. Первое – это советское восприятие, а это скорее синофобия. И второе – дело в том, что у нас почти никто не читает на китайском. И никто не смотрит китайских фильмов. Но у нас очень много фильмов и мультфильмов про Китай, которые создают Голливуд. Таким образом, парадоксальная ситуация. Картину про Китай нам во многом формируют кунг-фу панда, джеки чан и прочие герои. Что касается России, мы с, многие в зале смогут сейчас вам процитировать Пушкина, рассказать Толстого и Достоевского. В этом есть э, другая э, парадоксальная и, на мой взгляд, драматическая вещь. Восприятие России как цивилизации и восприятие России как нынешнего государства или политической системы, к сожалению, это два противоречия. 
Кто-то по-разному относится к нынешней политической системе, и он проецирует это и на Пушкина, и на Достоевского, и на Толстого. И язык русский, он потихонечку уходит. На мой взгляд, в этом смысле культурологическая серьезная драма. Что, которое, что касается Турции, Турция формально и символически считается нашим братом, потому что тюрки, потому что религиозность. Таким образом, сказать, что есть одна доминанта на сегодняшний день, скорее нет, есть динамика всех этих доминант. Uh, I studied in Moscow. I worked a few years in our embassy there. Uh, uh, now we are trying to communicate close to these uh, Chinese partners. And uh, uh, actually, I'm also puzzled uh, how we as a, uh, a country in between these big two powers uh, trying to balance this relationship. Uh, this, this clear understanding that uh, geographically uh, we are Uh, just obliged to find right language to speak to our uh, neighbors and, and uh, be in this uh, close cooperation. But uh, at the same time, there is a uh, uh, understood uh, danger, uh, and, and uh, if uh, everybody sh uh, you know understand that if Moscow and Beijing agree on something on you, then there is no escape for you. Uh, so uh, then. Uh, 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 right way to balance it have uh, you know many hooks uh, in uh, uh, with uh, partners in other part of the world. So uh, we try to reach uh, you know uh, Western countries and then partners and, and and try to involve them into projects in Kazakhstan. Uh, uh, it would be. Uh, you know, uh, oil fields, uh, uh, you know, other projects, uh, this project with uh, translation of textbooks and, and literature, it's also part of that uh, desire to be connected with the rest of the world in order to be uh, in a position to balance uh, with your neighbors to say that, you know, it's not only about you, but we'd like to be part of the bigger uh, global community and uh, we need Uh, uh, when it comes uh, to that situation, we would like to rely on that partners as well in order to communicate in the right way with you. So this kind of exchange uh, and uh, th this uh, 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 pattern of uh, uh, diplomacy, uh, uh, we, should, we should mention it when we, when we talk about this multi-dimensional foreign policy strategy. And do you think... The, do you think um Do you think there is a value in thinking about a regional identity in this region? Elmira was talking about the nomadic culture, and of course nomadic culture by definition was not a respecter of what we now regard as immutable national frontiers. So uh, do you think that a regional identity uh, makes sense in this part of the world more than perhaps other parts of the world? Um, we are very different. We are even very different within uh, one single country. It's very difficult to, to say about the region. Uh, Almira showed the picture, uh, and this range uh, from uh, you know, uh, patriarch patriarchal uh, uh, values uh, to, to modern, uh, it, it is real. And that is why it's uh, very difficult to say that You know, we can talk about some common understanding of uh, regional identity. Uh, uh, what is uh, quite neutral for myself might be very different from the, uh, you know, very close friend of mine. Sure. Uh, uh, and uh, this is heritage that we have uh, from, you know, our history. Yes, we have to deal with it, uh, but uh, it's not, there is no simple answer to that. Okay. Martin, uh, Martin and, and Kieran, you can, you can both say pass on this question if you like, but I, I, what, what are your, what's your perception of, uh, of, of this as a, as a region and, and what, what we might be doing from the UK to uh, 
engage with it on a regional basis in the same way that this forum is a regional forum, it's not just a forum in Kazakhstan. Is that something that we should be contributing to, uh, uh, helping to sustain the idea of a regional identity, or is that a, an irrelevance or just another of the many multiple manifestations of culture? I think it's probably not for us, um, but I think, you know, no identity can be forced, regional, national, uh, or, or city, but engaging and having a conversation around shared past or shared future, I think is important. But um, I think it, it's, it's really around, again, creating a conversation rather than pushing any view on any particular identity. Yeah, I mean, I, this is my first visit to this country. I've been here for 24 hours, you know. But so uh, I think you, you, you need to talk it more on a, on a global scale. Um, I mean, but by the way, what I love in terms of the conversation about Amati and, and Astana is this sense that all the boring grown-ups left a city and came here to do the government, leaving a city behind, but basically having a 24-hour party because mum and dad have just moved up the road. And, the, and what that offers a city in terms of its creativity and playfulness is absolutely brilliant, you know. Um, so I think, look, it, 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 you know, identities are really important. It's really important that they're playful and that they constantly change, that they're not anchored. So our relationship just as human beings, you know, even not artists, not the British Council, is just to share stories and those mechanisms for releasing the stories. And I think that was a, my biggest learning point in Hull. It wasn't when you were commissioning work, what you were doing, were you creating mechanism to release the story? Uh, and that will build a really playful identity. And that's what we can share with each other. Thank you. Well, as Elmira was talking earlier, um, I was thinking uh, Clifford Geertz, the, the American anthropologist, his definition of culture is stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. And uh, I think that's quite a, an interesting starting point. And you were saying, Elmira, how um, the, the, our perceptions, or many perceptions of China, are created in Hollywood rather than in China. Um, so the, the, the question I'd, I'd like to ask all of you is, uh, what's the, what do you think is the role of, of the creative industry, since that's what we're talking about, in helping to shape a, a, a cultural identity for the present and the future, which is not necessarily just projecting outwards, but is for the people of that place, the people of Hull, or the people of the UK, or the people of, of Kazakhstan. And I'm thinking, uh, I was doing some work in, in Chile with the Chilean government a few years ago, uh, and in their definition of the creative industries, they include food and gastronomy, of course, because food is, a, is the most is one of the most essential definitions of culture. And the culture minister said to me, one of the reasons we are passionate about identifying food as one of our cultural industries is all our kids are eating McDonald's and Burger King and uh, Subway, and we want to make sure that the, that the traditional foods cooking, eating habits of our own culture are not something that's just in the past, but something that's in the future. So, and I thought that was a very interesting perception of the role of the creative industries, not just in growing the economy, but in, in helping a society to tell the stories about itself that help to identify and clarify its culture in the contemporary world. You look like you're ready with an answer there, Almira, so I'm going to ask you first. Спасибо. Мне кажется, есть разное понимание того, что такое есть креативная индустрия. Во всяком случае, от того, что это, как это воспринимается в Китае и так, как я это слышу сегодня. Поверьте, Китай, Китай – это очень креативная индустрия, потому что там очень высокая конкурентность. И тема еды, гастрономии – и еще Китай обладает потрясающим качеством уникальной скоростной копирования всего, что возможно. И это касается городов. Может быть, вы знаете, есть город под, под Шанхаем, Суджоу, который полностью реставрирован я не знаю, 12 веком. Такого я не, не видела ни в одной стране. И это бизнес, безусловно, и это продажа, и это креативность связана, с одной стороны, с, тради, с традициями и с identity, а с другой стороны, это, это возвращение себя. Для государств, таких как страны Центральной Азии в том числе, 
когда возвращение себя после тысячелетий имеет большое значение, это не просто креативность, это, это... есть такое слово, я не знаю, на английском как это, ESMD, это memory studies, если вы говорите про антропологию. И это тоже очень, и, и, и это очень важно. И мне кажется, что когда мы говорим про культурную индустрию, она, это, это большое различие в зависимости от того, откуда мы это говорим. А с другой стороны, меня, например, немножко угнетает ситуация, когда в моей стране или в Центральной Азии культурная индустрия, индустрия ассоциируется в основном с этнопродакшн. Только этнопродакшн. Но мы вот бегаем на конях, изображаем кочевников, как бы древние традиции и роли, и это хорошо покупается, например, в Европе. Но я давно не видела такой продажи, например, рыцарей круглого стола. И, может быть, нам пора и в этом смысле тоже сравниться. И, может быть, когда мы говорим про креативную индустрию, может быть, нужно говорить о каких-то, вот, как опять сказал ваш коллега справа, о гуманитарных ценностей. Вы спрашивали, что может дать Британия нам, как региону, языки. Но это не только, безусловно, английский язык. Это еще язык восприятия себя как гражданственности. Дело в том, что в Европе, в Британии есть история, формирова... есть история травмы Второй мировой войны, есть история коммуникации, когда философы, менеджеры формировали этот Совет Европы, ООНовскую структуру. У нас, у нас такого опыта нет. А это же опыт прохождения жизни, это же опыт прохождения конфликтов. И в том числе здесь, ну я во всяком случае вижу очень много креативных методов, которые нам бы не помешали и в регионе, и в моей стране. I think we have to remember that the creative industry is an industry. So it's not only about the stories that we would like to tell, it's also the stories that people are prepared to hear. So it's, and a lot of the role of an artist is to connect one with the other. And if, you know, the, you know, we talk about Hollywood or the British film industry or a British theatre, for example. Um, you know, a show has to be worth going to and it has to be worth separating yourself from your money to go to it. So I think one of the things which um, the UK has been good at is recognizing how to take a story that is worth telling and then telling it in a way that is worth listening to. And if we can make that bridge, then that is something that is worth sharing, I think. Um, yeah, I... <laughs> There's, there's some more pragmatic stuff, really, isn't there? Uh, I, I think um, it was lovely, by the way, to hear about this idea of memory and the transfer of memory, because the, the legacy of memory is really powerful. It's an amazing. Um, a word of warning about the term creative industries. In the UK, it has been robbed by politicians to mean art that makes money. And, and, it, and it's being used to get round a conversation about subsidized arts, which is the fuel of everything. So uh, I don't know where the, that term is here at the moment. Be very, very wary of it being misused. Um, and also, uh, it's something we still don't talk about enough in the UK, we don't train it, is the role of the producer. I'm a really massive advocate about the role of the producer in the making of art, allowing, enabling artists to do things. And I think uh, we should all be transferring skills and talking about that more because we still don't teach people to be producers in the UK. Um, and, it, and it's vital to, to, again, just release those stories so that you can then, you know, be playful for, with them. And I think, you know... I reflect back on making the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games. That was a, an entire exercise in, be, in being playful about your stories. You know, take the Queen and throw her out of a helicopter. There is no more playful act than that. Uh, well, uh, I think from uh, 1991 for uh, probably a decade or more, uh, in the center of... Um, promotion of uh, uh, identity and then uh, you know uh, Kazakh culture to the world uh, we had only uh, uh, state power and then the government and then uh, a single film made by Sasha Baron Cohen which is a Borat actually uh, started a huge new cycle in, in this uh, um, in this job and uh, one of a sudden uh, Word creative, creativity, 
become integral part of political lexicon and, and uh, uh, political management in diplomacy because uh, of course everybody understands that uh, this single film almost ruined decade job done by Kazakh diplomacy at that time. And then uh, uh, everybody started to look for right ways to engage in this work. How to use a creative community, a creative power, soft power, in order to uh, uh, represent uh, the country, the culture in the world. So uh, uh, now we were all involved in this job. Thank you. Yes. Um. I'd like to, I'd like to, to pick up on, on something that, that Martin said. Uh, the, the definition of the creative industries is an interesting one because it's changed quite radically over the last 20 years. And I was talking to uh, uh, one of the, uh, a government official, a regional government official in England a little while ago about the definition that they use for the creative industries. And she said, we don't use a definition, it's a state of mind. And I thought that was a very interesting response by which she meant they think that creativity and connecting their economic planning with the culture of the region is an important thing to do. That was my understanding. And I think the, I think the the, the role of the creative industries and its relationship to the arts and culture is always going to be a very complicated one. Of course, it, it's not, and I think Martin is also right, that the danger that we have run into to some extent in the UK is that the creative industries is now seen as how we make money out of the arts. And therefore, the danger is the arts becomes feedstock for another bit of the economy. And it's a completely instrumental relationship. And of course the arts, cultural heritage, the creative economy are very, very different things, but they do have a relationship. And sometimes that relationship does not follow the conventional logics of, um, uh, of, of economic progress, if you like. So the, the power of the Borat film, the destructive power of the Borat film, the positive power of the Olympic ceremony. These are things which it's very, very difficult to quantify. But I think one of the, one of the roles of thinking about the future of the creative industries is what are the kind of supply chains that connect our cultural experience and our cultural heritage with economic possibilities? I think that one of the, one of the dangers of the creative industries is that we think about it as being very future-facing, about being digital industries, about industries of the future. And I think it is, of course it is. It's one of the fastest growing sectors of the economy, but it's also, it can be about picking up very, very traditional craft skills and very traditional stories and reinterpreting them for the future. And I think that's the, that's one of the one of the areas that we need to address. I'd like to ask the panel now what they think uh, the role of the, of the creative economy and the creative industries is in helping us reinterpret uh, memories, traditions of the past in a way that makes them more contemporary. Because I think that's a, that's a way in which we don't lose traditions of the past uh, and, and they can be revived and re-energized. And again, Kieran, could I start with you on that question? Thank you. Um, we did an exhibition in the British Council in London a couple of years ago now, which was about city nomads. It was working with artists and designers um, from here to, uh, to try and make that link. And it was to say, how do you connect the deep heritage of the steppes with living in a modern city? And for me, it was really quite enlightening because I think one of the roles of culture and the creative industries is to make these cities uh, we've been talking about livable. Because if we don't do it, we will have you know, these overcrowded concrete jungles, which are unpleasant to live in, but we may have to live in them because it's the only way we make money and live. Um, but I think that role of making sure that 
it connects us with where we came from and delivers that in a way which is contemporary and is modern and is viable in a city is part of what makes you know, these things we call cities livable. Um, now, if we can do that properly, then we're doing two things. One is we're, we're, we're looking after the present, but uh, the other thing is we, we're not forgetting where we came from and how we got here. But when we start doing that, then uh, the world becomes dull. Almira. Um, I think that creative industry должна порождаться тремя мотивациями. Первое – это, безусловно, диалог. Второе – это комфорт. И третье – это рефлексивность. Когда я говорю рефлексивность, я имею в виду вдохновение. И если три этих качества будут реализовываться, неважно в каком направлении а, формируется проект, тогда в этом имеет смысл. Um, I, I, I think we worry too much about the past. I think the, the, the past will always float in and out of our work. It needs neither suppressing nor encouragement. The problem with going on about it is it is absolutely suffocating to young people. And the answer here, as it is in every walk of life, is it, it's about young people. It's about making sure that creativity is on the core curriculum at school. There is no job in the world that does not require creativity at its heart. And if we stop teaching kids, sorry, if we stop releasing the inherent creativity of young people, because you don't teach it, you release it, then we're all in trouble. So, I, I, you know, I, w I wouldn't worry about the past. It, it, will, it will sort itself out. Uh, just, Rowan, just before you come back to that, I'd like to disagree a little bit with you, Martin. Uh, in London, partly because of the success of the City of Culture, uh, we thought we would try something which would be difficult to make work in London because it's a city of 10 million people. So we've initiated what we call a Borough of Culture program. There are 32 municipal boroughs that make up London and we invited them to compete to be the borough of culture. And many people said, uh, this is a waste of time, nobody will be interested. But of the 32 boroughs, 25 put in bids. And the competition became so intense that the big betting shops in London, the, the, the bet makers in London, were offering odds on which borough would win the first borough of culture and we've announced the first two and they are both boroughs which are outside the center of the city and are boroughs which are quite deprived but the reason I mention this and the thing that has interested all of us is that the energy for the borough of culture initiative has come from young people almost exclusively and yet one of the things that they all focus on is the heritage as they interpret it of their borough now they're not interested in the whether Queen Elizabeth I spent one night uh, in a pub before, you know, 500 years ago, but they are interested in a rapper who was born uh, in a housing estate nearby or a, a famous concert that took place. That it's their definition of heritage and culture. But the thing that has been really quite moving about this is the intensity of feeling that young people want to express the identity of their borough even if it's somewhere, I mean, you illustrated that with your picture of Hull, that it's, it was seen as one of the worst towns uh, in Britain. People, people want to have a kind of positive image of where they live, and they will pick up their interpretation of heritage to manifest it. So I think, I mean, I think young people are interested in heritage, but their own version of heritage, and that's one of the things that we should be listening to. Yeah, I actually think we're talking about the same thing, because I, I didn't say young people are not interested in history, part, far from it. I said don't force it on them, they will find their own version. Don't worry about it, and indeed they have, yeah. right? So I, I think we're talking about the same okay. thing. Rowan. I just want to add that, yes, you are right, uh, uh, our past is most powerful inspiration source uh, for uh, what uh, we should and can do now. But the question is uh, what filters we should use in order to 
understand and identify which part of our past can be part of our current life. Uh, is that uh, Western standards of what is right and what is wrong? Uh, or uh, we should uh, reconsider those filters to, to uh, be brave enough to bring everything? Uh, or uh, we should agree that uh, uh, something from past should stay in the past, but which part of it? So this discussion we have now. Thank you. Thank you. Look, we've got about uh, 10 minutes left, so uh, I would like to uh, open it up to the floor and ask if anybody has got a question they'd like to ask the panel or a comment they would like to make on our discussion so far. Please put your hand up. Wait for the, please wait for the microphone to come to you and say who you are before you ask your question or make your comment. Thank you. Um, John, you, you kind of preempted my question, um, but we've heard a lot this morning about collaboration and partnership and togetherness, but industry by its nature, creative industry and nationalism tend to be very competitive. Um, cities, countries, even artists are competing to be heard and competing to be seen. So my question to you is whether you consider competition to be harmful or healthy. Okay. Um I, I'm gonna, I will come back to that, but I'm going to dodge it by asking other members of the panel who would like to respond to that to come back first. Would anybody like to make a response to that? Competition is healthy um, because ideas have to be challenged. They have to be improved on. Um, I think if we were ever get to a position saying that um, you know, the creative sector will only do things collectively or together, then I, I think that spark will, will go. So I, I think competition is needed. I think for me it goes back to this role of the producer. I think, uh, yeah, artists go for it. Be competitive. You've got, to think, you've got to think about yourself. You've got to think about your funding. It's a completely natural state. What breaks that down is the role of the producer who will bring people together and, and collaborate. And I think as long as you've got that ecosystem, everything can exist in the way that it has to. It's when we, we lose that producer role, I think we get, we get into problems. Do you want to respond to that? Well, uh, yes, competition is healthy, but uh, also we should bear in mind that newcomers and uh, uh, those who are not uh, strong enough uh, yet should be supported also. Yeah. Uh, my response to that would be, I think we, it's a mistake to see competition and collaboration as complete opposites. They're not. They can coexist. And I, I think it happens, it doesn't happen very much in the area of the arts, but for example, I visited an engineering research laboratory in the north of England recently, and there are engineers from Airbus, Boeing, Rolls-Royce, uh, all kinds of major aerospace companies who I think of as competing with each other, but they're all collaborating on research. And talking to one of the people there, he said, well, now, because we are in such an advanced stage of thinking about aerospace, if you say number one is concept, and number 10 is the product, from number one to number nine, we collaborate, and then we compete like crazy for number 10. Uh, and I think uh, it's, a, it's a good lesson that actually there are times when it makes sense to compete, and there are times when it makes sense to collaborate, and the two are not necessarily at odds with each other. Can we have another question? I think we have a time for one reflection from the audience, and then we will close this, the... the okay. okay, why don't, why don't we take two questions quickly and then okay. the, the panel can respond okay. to whichever one they like. Здравствуйте, большая часть здесь быть. Меня зовут Дана Шехмет. Я все-таки размышляю да, про национальную идентичность. Да, и вот, Эльмира, вы сказали, очень интересно, что мы как сообщество после Советского Союза не прошли какой-то этап для того, чтобы сформироваться как граждане, как люди и так далее. Почему мы не можем просто скопировать что-то, да, и как бы использовать. Мы только и делаем, что копируем, мы используем что-то и пытаемся сделать это своим. Но почему мы как сообщество, зачем нам ждать несколько столетий, там, переживать несколько столетий, чтобы стать уже в конце концов активными гражданами, там, я не знаю, как-то какие-то вещи продвигать уже на международном уровне, оттолкнуться от всех этих замысловатых э, традиций, как бы и сохранить что-то свое, но при этом как бы делать это уже на другом уровне. Мне вот, я не хочу ждать. 
Я думаю, что поколение, да, как в Казахстане, на 30% молодежь, они не будут ждать там еще 100 лет, чтобы там, не дай лах, прошла какая-то там, ну, какая-то тяжелая, да, как бы ситуация в стране, чтобы что-то изменилось. И вот хотелось бы ваше мнение об этом услышать, потому что, ну, как бы время быстро идет, пока мы сейчас все раскрутимся с этим. Any other comment or question quickly? If not, okay. Uh, hi, I'm Sergey from Dushanbe. Uh, there was a very interesting issue we were discussing regarding uh, Central Asian com common identity. Uh, that's quite interesting for Tajikistan. That's like coming not from Turkish world, the world Turk world, but more like Pers Persian world. From other side. Uh, Let's recall European experience of uh, European coal and steel community from what everything started, I suppose. And uh, I think to start discussion about Central Asian identity is first of all to start discussion of how economically we are integrated and uh, on what level our economic uh, collaboration is. From other side, there is a follow-up question why we need to have a Central Asian ident identity? For what purpose? For what uh, practical purpose? Maybe you could try to answer this. Okay. I'm in wild agreement. <laughs> two, two options. Um, Martin, looks like you want to say something. I, well, I, do, I, I think you're right. You know, so often when we talk about identities, it's actually about sort of grown-ups enforcing things on people and actually just make your own one up. I think, you know, look no further than what some kids in some countries are doing around gender at the moment, right? They're being really playful. They're not, they're not assigning their babies genders. They're, they're non-binary. It's so fantastically playful. And they are very, very sure of who they are. And they don't need any enforced identity to do that. And and the more playful you are with it, the, the faster and more exciting your journey forward will be, I think. Спасибо за классный вопрос. Я не разделяю концепцию линейного развития, развивающегося, и что вот раз наша страна так далеко и, и так глубоко, значит, надо встать очередь и ждать очередь Британии. Я этого не разделяю. Мне кажется, креативная индустрия, ин, креативная индустрия может быть применена применена в том числе в государственном строительстве. Пока она у нас мифокреативная. Пока я вижу это так. И мне кажется, что один из залогов, все ответы я не знаю, но один я знаю точно, мне кажется, это честность. Мы за пафосностью, за мифичностью, за кочевниками и прочими батырами забываем говорить правду и поэтому не выносим уроки. Я говорила сегодня про Memory Studies. Как так, когда мы в развитии своего государства не помним ни репрессии, ни депортации, ни военнопленных, ни, голо ни голода? Это же не просто история, это же разные голоса, это память и это уроки на сегодняшний день. Вот в моей стране время от времени появляются новые репрессии, например. И я думаю, что не только в моей стране. Они ходят и потому, что мы не, не понимаем, что это такое, к чему это ведет. И, это, и, это, и вот таких вот, мне кажется, моментов очень много. Мне нравится британский дискурс, но я понимаю, что когда мы говорим о колониальности, мне кажется, мы все еще говорим не про одно. Хотя, мне кажется, у нас есть чему поучиться и о чем поговорить. И креативно, и в плане креативной индустрии в том числе. Мне кажется, нужно просто честнее говорить, честнее разбираться, снять этот жирный, толстый, кро... этот кремовый э, вот этот вот слой, да, и уже говорить про там, хлеб, в конце концов. Пока этого не будет, мы будем жить в иллюзиях. И даже креативную индустрию мы будем воспринимать только с точки зрения этнопродаж, этнокультурных продаж. Но это же гораздо интереснее, как мне кажется. Just to comment on speed, um, society is changing incredibly quickly at the moment. 
Um, you know, we talk a lot about you know, democracy in the United Kingdom and it started with the Magna Carta. Well, nothing much happened for a few centuries. You know, it's, you know, we're just marking now 100 years since some women were allowed to vote. So nothing happened for a long time, but in the last 100 years, suddenly society is moving very quickly. And I think we need to capitalize on that and recognize that maybe it's because of technology, maybe it's because of science or progress or uh, improvement in healthcare, so we've got the time in our lives to change the societies we live in. Um, but we, as you know, people who are interested in culture and art, are part of that change, and therefore we are the people who will make that change happen. Well, thank you all. Uh, according to the program, we're out of time, I'm sorry. According to the program, I'm supposed to give a five-minute summing up, which it would be completely impossible to do on the basis of the discussion we've had. I think, Almira, you did a beautiful summing up a moment ago when you said, we can learn from you and you can learn from us. That seems to me that's really the core of this session. I would say two things briefly. One is, there are now around 60 major cities in the world that call themselves creative cities. And I, that's an extraordinary fact that's just arisen over the last 20 years or so. And it does seem to me that uh, one of the responses to globalization has been that at city level, at national level, at community level, people want to feel that they have some stronger sense of their own identity. And that's not necessarily aggressive, but it can be quite assertive. And if it's assertive, that's no bad thing. The important thing is to remember that we can learn from you and you can learn from us. And, and in talking about multiple identities, we've had quite a lot about multiple identities this morning. Uh, and I remember listening to the great Indian economist, Amartya Sen, uh, who said, people, people seem to have a problem with multiple identities. He said, why is there a problem? When I'm at the passport control desk in the airport, I don't say I'm a vegetarian. And when I'm in the restaurant, I don't say I have an Indian passport. I have two different identities. I have lots of different identities. And I think uh, sometimes we make um, that good phrase, we make a mountain out of a molehill. We give ourselves problems. In fact, the way we live our lives, we have multiple identities anyway. And we ought to be able to uh, have our, our various identities with enough confidence to feel that we can share and learn from other people and they can share and learn from us. So thank, will you please thank our panel for the contribution of the last 40 minutes. <laughs>